We are uh, continuing a series that we've been walking through, uh, or in which we've been walking through the book of First John together. Uh, so if you have your Bible today, which I, I hope that you do, uh, we're going to stare at it for a little bit and see what the Lord would have to say to us through First John chapter 3, uh, verses 11 through 18 today, verses 11 through 18. So you can open your Bible to First John chapter 3, 11 through 18. Um, today's message is called Truly Love One Another. And so John is issuing yet again another moral test of faithfulness to God, a moral test of fellowship with the Lord. How do you know that you're in fellowship with God? How do you know that you are a Christian? How do you know that these things are true? Uh, well, it's by the things that you know and the things that you do. That is what John wants us to understand. And so today, this is a moral test of love, love within the fellowship in particular, love within uh, the body of believers. And so we're going to look at that today, uh, 1 John chapter 3, 11 through 18. I would ask that you uh, stand now as we read God's Word. When I'm finished reading, I'll say, this is the Word of the Lord, and you will respond, thanks be to God. 1 John 3, 11 through 18. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his, brothers in, sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk but in deed and in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. And we ask now uh, that by the power of your spirit at work in us, that you would open our hearts and minds uh, to see and to understand, to hear and to know your word. Uh, Lord, help us to, uh, as we read your word today, to come to a better understanding of who you are, and of who you have called us to be, that by saving us through Christ, you have given us uh, new desires, you've given us a new ability to obey you and to follow your Son. And so we ask now that you would help us to obey the commands of God here as we see them in this passage. May this test that John has written for us, may it be a helpful barometer for us to know whether or not we are saved, to know whether or not we are truly in fellowship with God and with his people. And so again, we ask for your help. We need wisdom from the Spirit. We need illumination from the Spirit. We need guidance from the Spirit as we uh, read your word today, as we hear it preached. And Lord, I pray that you would help me, uh, help me to preach under uh, the influence and power of your Spirit today and not under any human uh, volition or ideas of my own conception. Lord, we love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There's a um, Christian apologist uh, who wrote a book called The Mark of a Christian, and uh, his name is Francis Schaeffer, and uh, the book was written a few decades ago. It's a short little book. It's worth picking up if you haven't read it. But he starts the book this way, he says, Through the centuries, men have displayed many different symbols to show that they are Christians. In other words, they're doing something outwardly to let people know that they're Christians. He says they have worn marks in the lapels of their coats, they have hung chains about their necks, and they've even had special haircuts. <laughs> he says, of course, there's nothing wrong with any of this if one feels it is his calling, 
But there is a much better sign, a mark that has not been thought up just as a matter of expediency for use on some special occasion or in some specific era. It is a universal mark, and it is to last through all the ages of the church till Jesus comes back. And then he asks, what is the mark? He turns us, uh, our gaze, our attention to Christ. He says, at the close of his ministry, Jesus looks forward to his death on the cross. He looks forward to the open tomb. He looks forward to his ascension. And knowing that he is about to leave, Jesus prepares his disciples for what is to come. And it is here that he makes clear what will be their distinguishing mark, or we might say the distinguishing mark of the Christian. In John chapter 13, verses 33 through 35, which is written by uh, the same apostle who wrote 1 John, which we are studying now. Jesus says there, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I, told, as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this... All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Francis Schaeffer continues, he says, This passage reveals the mark that Jesus gives to label a Christian, not just in one era, not just in first century Christianity, or in one locality, those who were there in Jerusalem. No, it's at all times. This is the mark at all times of true Christians and in all places of true Christians, until Christ returns. And so I've summed up the passage this way today for us. You can write this down if you'd like. Brotherly love is an essential mark of the true Christian. Brotherly love is an essential mark of the true Christian. It is what distinguishes, as we looked at last week, so you need to remember that this argument that he's continuing on comes as um, furthering the argument he started last week where he talks about those who are the children of God and those who are the children of the devil. And so this mark that he introduces now of the children of God is that they will love. And what he's going to show us in this passage is that those who are the children of the devil will hate, they will murder, they will not be considerate of others. They have no desire to do such things. And so he's saying this is what distinguishes the children of God from the children of Satan, love. Particularly, love for the brethren, love for the brothers, love for the brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? And the New Testament is so clear on this command. Like, it, it, <laughs> you can't miss, I mean, Christ has just said it for us, and so it's no wonder that the apostles in their writings are going to go ahead and continue those things, right? If they hadn't, they would have been disobedient to, to Christ. And, well, as you know, that's not a good thing. And so the New Testament writers continue these thoughts. Paul says in Romans 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so how do we love the brothers? How do we know that we're going to love the brothers? Well, first and foremost, we must have received the love of God, which is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. There will be no love for the brothers apart from love that's been received from God. Amen? It might show up in a season. It might look pretty for a bit. But there will be no lasting eternal love for other Christians unless you too have been saved. Unless you have experienced and come to know the love of God in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22, after having described the fruit of the flesh... Paul goes on to describe the fruit of the Spirit. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So he's, just, he's not listing the only fruit of the Spirit. He's just saying, here's nine of them. But what was the first one? Love. Fruit of the Spirit is love. So those who have had the love of God poured into their heart by the Holy Spirit now exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, which will be love. There's a love there. 
1 Thessalonians, Paul writes in chapter 4, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. Meaning, you're doing a bang-up job. You guys understand how to love one another. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, he says. In 1 Peter 1, 22, Peter writes, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So as the love of God, again, has been poured into your heart by the Spirit of God, it is now working itself out in the character that the Spirit possesses, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And so your character is changing. You're becoming a new creation. You're experiencing exactly what Dylan and Danny were able to say, my life changed. I saw the fruit of salvation in my life. I observed it. Well, what was that fruit? I, I would bet that they would tell you. They began to love the brothers. They began to love the church, the people of God. It became important to them to be involved in church, to be around the members of the church, to be committed together, striving together, as Paul writes, in one faith, with one mind, for the sake of the gospel. Amen? This is part of what the Spirit of God does in us. We've said it before that the Spirit of God in me is going to love the Spirit of God in you. Amen? We're not going to hate one another. There should be no hate among us. In 2 John, verse 6, and this is love, John writes, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Amen. I will add that there are times where I think the text is going to be a difficult word for our church, where it's going to challenge us. It's going to press against us because it presses against me in study, right? And and the things of the heart get revealed as you look into the, the perfect law of God. And then there are times where I come to a text and I can say, I think, along with Paul in 1 Thessalonians, that concerning brotherly, lo brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. You guys are doing a wonderful job at loving one another. I truly believe that. Among the members of the body of this church, you guys do a really really great job at this. There's a room for improvement? Always. Do we fail one another? Always. But that's part of loving others, right? Is that love covers a multitude of sins. There's a desire to bear with one another. There's, there's a desire to endure all things together. There's a desire to weep with one another and rejoice with one another. There's, a, there's desire to help each other in our difficulties, to be there. Amen? And I, I praise God for that. You can see it in home groups. You can see it in other small groups that get together uh, that you guys truly love one another. And so I, I do praise the Lord for this. But I want you to understand that such love is in opposition to the world. And that's what John wants his readers to understand, that you are being attacked by these false teachers, by those who have gone out from us, who are saying in some way, apparently, they're denying the fact that the brothers should love one another. They've already denied that Christ is Lord. They've already denied that he's the Son of God. They've denied their own sinfulness. And, and now comes the argument that you don't have to love one another. You can hoard things for yourself. You can be a selfish Christian. And John writes here and he says, no such thing is true. You cannot be a selfish Christian. You must love one another. And if you do not love one another, then the love of God is not in you. That's what he's getting at here. And so God doesn't merely command that we love one another. The beautiful thing about what God is doing as he's poured love into our hearts by the Spirit is that he enables you to love one another. He doesn't command something that he's not also enabling you to do as you seek him. Amen? That's part of, again, dwelling among believers is that you have to learn how to love one another. You may, like if you're married, you know this, you're learning how to love a sister in the Lord or how to love a brother in the Lord and whom you're married to. And that can be a difficult thing. When two sinners say, I do, worlds collide. 
kingdom buildings collide, right? And you start learning how, to, how do we work together in marriage? How do we exalt Christ in our marriage? And so you're having to learn those things. So the Lord uses marriage to sanctify you. In many of the same ways, the Lord uses the body of Christ around you to sanctify you. He wants to help you grow. You're going to come up against or rub shoulders with people whose personalities are different than yours, whose interests are different than yours. People in the church are going to let you down at times. They're not going to be there for you. I've bragged on you for being there for each other. There's going to be times where someone's not and you wish they had been, and, and the, the enemy is going to seek to, make, to embitter you towards them because of that. You see what I'm saying? So, so there has to be... As Paul writes in Ephesians 4.32, you must learn to be kind and tenderhearted toward one another, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. These things must be evident. That's part of loving one another, is learning how to forgive. Again, marriage is a great help in this. Having children is a great sanctification, right? It's, it's a help in, in how, how much do I love myself, right? Children help push those buttons and help you see those things. And if we're not careful, we'll blame them for faults that are actually in us that we need to overcome and we need to seek the Lord to help us in. Little side pastoral tangent there. But John isn't introducing some new idea. And he wants that to be clear. This is the things that you have heard from the beginning, he says. You've heard this from us. What does he mean from the beginning? These are the things that have been declared from the beginning, that you should love one another. Meaning this was on the Apostle John's lips and the other Apostle's lips always. Always. One of my favorite things that I've ever read from the Apostle Paul happens in uh, the book of Thessalonians. And he says there that we came to you. He's talking about the way in which... uh, they came to the believers there in Thessalonica. He says, we came to you as nursing mothers, and we appeared before you as fathers. I just think that's so incredible to think about the differing loves of a mother and a father and how they complement one another and how they are working together to raise children. And the apostle is saying, we came to you in these ways. We loved you as a mother. We loved you as a father. You see, they didn't just say you should love one another. What I'm showing you is that they bore these things out in their own lives. They committed to truly love the brethren, to be selfless in their approach, often going without things in which they should have been entitled to rightfully. They could have requested in a right manner, and yet they went without so that they could show the love of Christ, which had been poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit so that the other brothers there could come to know the love of Christ as well. So here in 1 John, we've got false teachers who are seeking to disrupt Christian love in the churches among the brethren. And John intends to show them, no, 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 no. What you have heard from the beginning, once again, we're seeing this phrase, what you've heard from the beginning, that is the truth. What we have proclaimed to you is the truth. Those early teachings that would have included the truth about Jesus Christ, that would have included the truths of the gospel, of mankind's sin and rebellion, of the need for righteous living, and of the commands to love one another. All of that would have been included. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect example of this. John holds him out as the example. He is the one who has laid down his life for his friends. And so you and I cannot love to the same degree. We're not going to be the Lord and Savior of someone's life. But we can obey John's command to love one another the way Christ loved. That is, we can obey by the power of the Spirit in whom we have received the love of God. And so then we can be lovingly and selflessly sacrificing for others. And so John goes on to show the difference between the love of God's children and the hate or indifference that masquerades as love within Satan's children. That's really what he wants to show you here. And so we see the marks of Christian love. The first thing that John shows us is that love does not murder. Love does not murder. That seems obvious, right? 
It seems obvious until you learn here that love or that murder uh, is hate and that hate is murderous. 1 John 3.12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. In verse 14, he says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. And so for John, murder is the ultimate act of hate. It demonstrates an absence of love in the most extreme way. When you take someone's life, that's the ultimate act of hate. That's why John uses Cain as his example here. It's important for us to see Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. God introduces them very early in his word so that we can begin to understand these concepts of right worship and wrong worship and what right worship, how right worship is going to infuriate those who oppose God. But we can also understand murder and hate and the sinfulness of man that resulted in the garden. So one chapter afterwards you have the first murder. And it's two brothers. Cain, as a worshiper of God, offered him a sacrifice. Unlike his brother Abel, however, Cain did not bring an acceptable sacrifice to God. Abel brought an animal sacrifice that was of the firstborn of his flock, which the narrative implies was in obedience to God's command. And on the other hand, Cain ignored the divine requirement and brought an offering of the fruit of the ground for his. And so far from being a true worshiper of God, both Cain's disobedience and then his subsequent murder of his brother reveal that he is of the evil one, which is why John says Cain is of the evil one. You see the narrative in Genesis chapter 4, 2 through 8. It says, Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. But God gives Cain an opportunity for repentance and right worship. He even warns him of the direction of his heart and his life, where he's headed. You must rule over these things, Cain. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So that Cain was of the evil one means that he belonged to the kingdom of darkness. He was not interested in worshiping God rightly. And I want you to know that those who are not interested in right worship, those who are not interested in worshiping God correctly, those who are not interested in submitting themselves to the Lord, are the ones who hate true righteousness. This is the issue with the Jews and Jesus Christ. They hate true righteousness. They hate the work of God, and so they rise up to kill Jesus. When John mentions that Cain belongs to the evil one, the term evil one denotes a determined, aggressive, fervent evil that actively opposes good. It has no interest in good. It is always evil, but it's determined to oppose good. And so the meaning extends beyond just basic evil or corruption and includes this type of malignant sinfulness that pulls others down into ruin. It says, not only am I of the evil one, but my life's goal is to make you of the evil one as well, and so I'm pulling you down. I want to destroy you. 
And so Cain, belonging to the evil one, murdered his brother in the field. He violently murdered his brother because he was resentful and jealous over Abel's offering being accepted while his was rejected. And so in jealousy and envy, Cain offers a sacrifice to his God. He takes his brother's life for the evil one. And why did he do this, John asked. Because his deeds were evil, John says, and his brothers were righteous. It's that simple for John. One was evil, one was righteous. Cain hated righteousness so much that he murders his brother. And like Cain, the ungodly resent the righteous because through their righteous actions, you understand this, you need to understand this, that your righteous actions expose the false beliefs and the wicked practices of those who are evil. And if you've ever had your wickedness exposed, one of your first things to do is to cover with fig leaves. It's to get defensive. And then it's to go on the offensive. We see this in Adam and Eve. Cover themselves with fig leaves, hide from God. When God comes to them and asks the hard questions, they begin to blame one another. They attack one another. The same things are happening today, brothers and sisters, when you rightly live for the Lord. When you give yourself to a life of righteousness, you will make enemies. In fact, if your Christianity is so quiet that you have no enemies, you ought to question it a little bit. If your Christianity is agreeable to everyone in your workplace who obviously lives a life opposed to Christianity, then you ought to question whether or not you are abiding in righteousness and godliness. This doesn't mean you walk around beating people over the head with the word, but it means that you probably shouldn't be as agreeable as you are. There is a sinful agreeableness is what I'm saying. We must seek to live at peace with everyone, yes, but that's not at the sacrifice of truth and righteousness. They don't sacrifice those things for peace. That's not real peace. Then they get peace and you get no peace. Because you're in turmoil if the Spirit of God is actually alive in you. You know, I'm hiding these things. I'm keeping these things under wraps and it's bothering you. It eats away at your flesh. So those who have passed out of death into life, they're assured of this reality that the world is going to hate them because of their love for God and their love for one another. It's going to look weird to the world. They're not going to like it. The, the new birth which grants life to those who are spiritually dead turns hateful and even murderous attitudes into loving ones. You're a new creation. And so once you may have hated the brothers, you may have hated the church, you may have hated the things of God, and now you're saying, I love all of those things. I would give my life for them. Amen? And so John reminds us that anyone who does not love has not received spiritual life. They abide in spiritual death still. He goes on, he says in verse 13, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. If everyone who hates his brother, verse 15, if everyone who hates his brother, sorry, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So in God's eyes, hatred is the moral equivalent of murder. So, we, so John just explicitly says everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. The only outward difference between murder and hate, then, is the deed itself but there's the same heart there. There's the same heart that's opposed to God and opposed to his people. Matthew 5, 21, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. And so unrepentant, 
unconverted sinners will be eternally condemned for their habits of hate. Those attitudes of hate, even if they never actually lay a hand on someone. But believers have been transformed by the Spirit of God to love other believers, to love unbelievers, to proclaim truth to them, to live lives where they're acting in good deeds, in truth, which we'll get to here in a moment. But they're not afraid to shine the light of Christ before a watching world in which they know many will hate that. But the promise we have from God is that many will come to love those things as well. There will be many who are saved in the proclamation of the gospel. And so we proclaim, brothers and sisters, whether we will be hated or not, that matters not to us. We live lives of righteousness because it might mean that someone comes to know Christ as Lord. And so to be freed from hate, free from hell, free from a bondage of sin and death, freed unto Christ by the Spirit of God. And so it matters very much that we love one another and that we love unbelievers in such a way that we're willing to proclaim truth to them and do good deeds for them. And so we shouldn't be shocked by the world's hatred and oppositions. We should expect it because the world has nothing in common with the kingdom of God. Nothing in common with the kingdom of God. There's nothing in common with the lives of the righteous. And those lives of the righteous, not only is there nothing in common, but they are a, re are a rebuke for those who are wicked. And so in John 15, 18 and 19, Jesus says this in some of his final moments with his disciples before his arrest. He says, if the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Well, the world's opposition often is a good indicator that you are in right fellowship with God. Jesus continues in verse 23 there in John 15. He says, whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. You see, Jesus' works, those deeds in truth, were a rebuke. These things were written so that the law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. They were a rebuke to those who hated me. And so by their hatred, the children of Satan have always revealed their true character. By the way that they hate God's people, they reveal who they truly are. Enemies of the gospel have always persecuted those who love the truth. Even today, believers around the world endure great persecutions and even suffer death at the hands of the hateful, at the hands of the murderous. People are still spilling their blood for the cause of Christ, and praise God for it. Christianity has advanced on the blood of many martyrs. We have defended the truth when no one else would. Amen? We, we must be grateful for such courage and we're fortunate to live in a country where that sort of courage isn't often required of us. You're not faced with life and death. To be baptized in other countries marks you for certain death. To be baptized in the U.S., well, that's just another Sunday in a church in South Arkansas for many. I'm not saying that's what's actually happening in the heart of the people being baptized. Amen? I'm just trying to show the difference in what you may face in persecution versus what others may face. But I'm telling you, you're in an increasingly hostile environment, and you need to decide whether or not you're going to believe these things in such a way that it makes a difference in your life, 
or if you're going to bow before man and the evil one when they come knocking at your door. Because it may seek you out quicker than you realize. It's not to scare you. I just want you to be aware that the world hates Christians. It's obvious. If you'll open your eyes for 30 minutes and look around, you'll see that it's true. You pay attention to the headlines. You pay attention to the things that are being espoused in your children's TV shows and in your children's schools and in um, books that are coming out and in things that are being espoused in higher education so that we're making more and more people who hate Christians. We're discipling them. That's what's happening. The children of the devil are discipled as well. And I'm just saying you don't have to look far. And you'll see it. You'll see these things. And so you need to know, how am I going to raise children in the world? And I think that you have a great opportunity to raise children in a world like this. I don't think you have reason for fear at all. I think you have every reason to believe that Christ wants to honor his word. And he wants to bless your home. And he wants to honor the things that you commit yourself to as you're committing yourself to him and to his word. And you're saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You guys can go serve pagan gods, but this house is going to remain committed to Christ Jesus as Lord. Amen? And that when you do that, the Lord wants to bless those efforts. You don't have to be afraid. You shouldn't be afraid. The enemy wants you fearful, but Christ Jesus creates fearlessness in us. It's really what Paul gets at, in, at towards the end of Philippians 1 in verse 27. He talks about there how you, it's going to be granted to you. It's granted to you by God, which is really incredible, that not only do you believe, but you will suffer. And that as you believe and suffer, as belief meets suffering, and in their case it was persecution of the church, Paul's in prison writing this, but as belief meets suffering, it creates a fearlessness. And he says that this fearlessness is going to become a, a flag. It's going to be a sign unto them of death. But for you, it's a sign of life. And that's really incredible. That Paul, back in the first century, is writing a letter that by the power of the Holy Spirit still means a lot to us today. Amen. You are granted by God both belief and suffering. And as belief meets suffering, suffering meets belief, there's fearlessness created in the heart of the believer, and there's fear created in the heart of unbelievers. They know that they are perishing, but you know that you belong to eternal life. I love it. I think John's saying something similar here as he gets into the world will hate you, and I'm saying to you that that's okay. He says that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Which doesn't mean that a believer could never murder someone and then not be repentant unto faith, and, or that someone who has murdered someone in the past could now never be saved from their sins. But it does mean that those who are characterized by hateful attitudes going on in hate, those who are regularly harboring murderous thoughts, right? Just disdain for the brethren. Those people evidence that they have an unregenerate heart. They evidence that unless they repent of their sins, they will perish eternally. They must receive Christ as Lord, receive Christ as Savior. That's their hope. John shows us here that love is not indifferent also. Love is not indifferent. Love acts. 1 John 3, 16 through 17, he says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So he's issuing a test here. He says, how, how then do we know love? How do we know? Well, one, he's saying you must know experientially Christ. You must have experienced the love of Christ. 
By this we know love. How? That he laid down his life for us. And so then we also ought to, that's a command, we must lay down our lives for the brothers. And so John lays out here that love is the distinguishing mark of the Christian. In Philippians 2, Paul builds this out in verse 6, 5 and 6. As he says that you are to have this mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though being equal with God, counted, his, counted that as not and became man, so that he might die for the sins of his people. And that at his name one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. But don't forget the first part. He, you have this mind which is yours in Christ to consider others greater than yourselves, Paul writes. Consider others as greater than yourself. So Christ gave up all so that believers may be willing, may be able to give up everything to help others. He is our perfect example, and this attitude must permeate throughout the, the church. It must shine forth in the believer's love for one another. It must be evident that these people love each other. And I submit to you that that's hard to observe in Sunday morning worship, but real easy to observe in weekly practice, in the lives we build. And the way that we orient ourselves either toward the brethren or away from the brethren. Either we're seeking, how can we be more involved with one another? How can we be more near to each other? Whether it's through groups and then beyond that, other ways, right? We're orienting our hearts and our minds and our lives toward each other. That's where these things become evident. But if we don't, then we should ask ourselves, do I love the brothers? Do I love my brothers and sisters in the Lord? They mean anything to me. I've committed as a member to be a part of the body, but am I a part of the body? Right? We, we should ask these questions. Christ's atoning death is the prime example of selfless love. It's our example of how to love the brothers. And so John exhorts us that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. The selfish indifference of unbelievers stands in sharp contrast to the generous, compassionate love that believers are told to exhibit here. John illustrates the difference in attitude in really practical terms, right? I mean, he makes it really, really clear. He says, but if anyone has the world's goods, meaning if they have wealth and the things they need, material possessions, things that won't mean much in eternity, but they're helpful here, if they have those things, and they see their brother in need, yet they close their heart against him, meaning they turn away from him. They shut themselves off. There's no compassion there for his state. They see his need, which, by the way, is not a want. It's a genuine need, something lacking that is needed. And then they shut themselves off to him. John just asked, frankly, how does God's love abide in such a person? And so he's using these world's goods to illustrate that the children of the devil often have the world's goods. But when they give sacrificially, and I put that in scare quotes, when an unbeliever gives sacrificially to anyone else, they're motivated by selfishness. You think about it. An unbeliever's philanthropic efforts are usually merely to pacify their consciences, it's to help them feel better about themselves. It's to satisfy their emotions. Oh, they're, they're moved to emotion, and so they help someone. But typically, it's to bring honor to themselves rather than to glorify God. And you can think about that as you see people give massive amounts of money and then make sure their name is attached to it in some way. This is a dangerous way to live, is what John is saying. We must not be selfish. We must be selfless. That's where John closes his argument. Third and final point here is love works in truth. What well, love works in truth. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. In deed and in truth. 
What's John saying? He says, don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Amen? We've all met the person who can talk the talk and never walk the walk. And it's maddening. You've probably laughed to yourself about it before as you've observed such things. But John is saying here, don't be the kind of Christian who says, I love you. I love the brothers. But doesn't evidence that in deeds of truth. John is saying the proof must be in the pudding. There must be evidence. And that proof is that if we are God's child, if we have professed genuine love, and then we will not let love rest in polite statements, but in righteous deeds. We are not satisfied to merely say, I love you, I'm praying for you, to make quaint statements, and then to never actually go on to show that we love or ever actually go on to utter a prayer before the Lord for those people. But that we actually commit ourselves to loving the brothers. Love works in truth. So there won't be these empty I love yous that are evident. I'm not saying they won't ever show up. That's part of how we're crucifying the flesh, I think. But there won't only be empty I love yous. You won't exist in a church of people who just come in and present a certain facade about themselves, but they desire to be known, to be truly known, so that they can also truly know you, and therefore you can truly partner together in gospel ministry by loving one another. Amen? And so we tear off the mask. We're not interested in presenting a certain part of me that I want people to love. No, it's just here's who I am. I'm not what I want to be, but praise God, I'm not what I once was. And by His grace, I am what I am. Amen? There won't be empty I love yous, rather there will be deeds in truth. Now, Deeds in truth here, he says in deed and in truth, but it's describing a certain kind of deed. It's a deed in truthfulness, meaning they're true deeds. They're according to the truths of God, but they're true works, right? They're, they're, they're true acts of love, meaning they're upright. I'm not, I'm not acting in love toward you. I didn't bake you the cake in your grief, or I didn't visit you in your grief so that I could walk away patting myself on the back and feeling good about what I've done. No, I I did those things because I genuinely love you. It was a a true work. You see what I'm saying? Because he says, let us not do this in word or talk or talk or word, but let us do these in deed and in truth. So these are deeds that are truthful. But that word truth there carries around carries with it dependability christians ought to be dependable they ought to be the kind of people that you can depend on that their works are dependable when they say you know their yes is yes and their no is no and when they've committed to do the work when they've committed to be a part of the body they're dependable in that You can trust it. You can see that it's true. They don't commit to do something and then fail to carry out their obligation. Their their works are true. They're upright before God and before their brothers. Now, it's not to say you won't commit to something at times and then something genuinely pops up. But if you're the kind of person that something is always popping up and always interfering, you're not dependable. And you should be a a dependable Christian. Your brothers and sisters ought to be able to count on you. Amen? We ought to be able to know that when you commit to something, you're committed to it. When you're committing to bear with someone or to weep with someone or to uh, rejoice with someone or you're committed to serve in some capacity, right? That that's dependable. That's what John is outlining here. He says these works are true and they're dependable. They're upright. There's no shadows with them. You don't have to guess the motives. You don't have to wonder about the genuineness of the person. It becomes obvious, amen? And I think that's a good, really, really strong word for us today on what it looks like to have love that works in truth. 
For John, the difference between the children of the devil and the children of God, these things could not be more distinct. He's very clear. Those who murder, those who habitually hate, those who act indifferently to the needs of believers and of others do not have eternal life. But those who, as a part of their repentance and faith, their regenerate hearts that the Lord has granted to them, those who have become new creations, they're renouncing murderous, hateful ways that, that gives evidence that they have been born again. They're committed to serving the brothers. They're committed to selfless love in the church. And in place of those sinful traits, Christians begin to show genuine love to others. God is removing those deeds of the flesh, and he's granting to them the deeds of the Spirit. The character of the Spirit of God is showing up in their life. Amen? They're going to love people, but they're especially, especially going to love the brothers. Their hearts are especially geared towards helping one another because the love of God has been shed abroad in their hearts. Amen? Brotherly love is an essential mark of the true Christian. I commend this to you. I think that you are doing well in these things. But I hope that today's word is a challenge. It's a, it's a way to stir you up to love and good works as we have met together today. Amen? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are righteous in every way. And that there was no, you, you would have been just, Father, had you not sent your Son. And had Christ not given up the glories of heaven to become like us, he would have been just. But instead, you have chosen to become both just and justifier. That we might come to know you and to know your love experientially, intimately. That we might be saved from our sins, called out of darkness, brought into light. And Lord, we thank you that we can testify as Christians that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by your Spirit. And so we praise you for it. I ask now that you would gear, orient our hearts, transform our hearts to be loving toward the brethren that we would have a desire to serve one another, to love one another deeply, uh, to help one another along in life, to challenge each other when that time comes, to correct each other should those days come, to yield our hearts to discipline, to yield our hearts to those corrections, but to see it all as an act of your sanctifying love in us today. And so I praise you for the local church. It is the dearest place on earth. There's nothing greater. There's no institution more powerful. There's nothing in the world like it. We praise you for it, Lord, that you have called us out of our sins, brought us into righteousness through your son, Jesus. We ask now that you would help us to respond to this message according to your spirit and the ways that he leads us and guides us, directs us now. Help us to seek you. I'm going to give you a moment to do that now. You can seek the Lord in prayer, whether that's through repentance, whether that's through believing something here today that you haven't previously thought or seen that the Lord's revealed to you. I ask that you take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your work today. We thank you that you have chosen to meet with us in worship, that you've called us to meet with you, and so we have. We have joined with angels 
in heaven. We've joined with saints who have gone on before us in heaven to worship you today. What a joy, what a privilege. And Lord, not only that, but you are moving in our hearts and minds even now. You're sanctifying us. You're transforming us. You may be, you may be calling someone even now out of darkness and into that marvelous light of salvation. And so I pray that you would help them to respond in repentance and faith, belief that Christ is Lord, a desire to submit themselves to him. And Lord, would you help us who profess belief already, who would say that we have been saved by Christ. Would you help us to walk in those same fruits, lives marked by repentance and faith each day? We do love you greatly. Amen.